Okay, we can get started. It's a lean class today. Um, so the um, the homework assignment was graded. It's it's in the department being sorted. So if you go by the department, I think secretaries have a little file folder for each of you, right? Um, so this is the overall score we have. We have covered up to 25% of the grades. And I, th I don't know what that means for the grade for the people up there. But I think for like these people, the first 10, they seem to be kind of noticeably falling off, right? Um, and I'm going to send an email this afternoon for, for at least these folks. Some of you maybe didn't turn in one of their homework or program or something. Um, some of you did poorly throughout or whatever. And we'd like to see what, what's happening with those folks and move them up. In fact, I would, you know, I would like to see um, if there's something obvious that, that is holding you back, right? So um, my intention is not to have a certain number of A's and certain number of B's and all those things, right? So you know, if all of you did well, I don't mind giving all of you A. But if you're sort of like, like this person, like this one person whose grade is right here, <coughs> you're making it very hard for me to do anything about it, right? It's, it's about 50%. Um, and so if you are here, try to see if you can move things up. Um, we have so many data points. So if I, if I look at the end, if I look at that you're consistently falling behind, then that's very little I can do, right? So if you have any concerns, talk to me. And I, th I think the homework assignment, you know, the TA is graded a certain way. If you have any concerns about whether your answer is right and, and he didn't give good grades or something, um, talk to me, right? Does that make sense? I think one of you expressed frustration at the homework assignment, right? The, the second homework assignment. And I would like to talk to that person too to see um, these, these topics are, are not exactly trivial, but not, it shouldn't be that hard, especially the homework assignment. It came from the book. I mean, the solutions were sort of in the, in the book, right? Um, but if this topic kind of bothers you, um, I, I'd like to see what we can do, right? Um, so on that vein, let me. So how is the projects coming along, the homework project two? Hmm? Not good, I heard some not good, right? So how many of you looked at the program, how many understand what you need to do? Well, that's not good. I only see like one or two people, right? Um, like I said, this this is not exactly a trivial program. You can just you can just look at it at the end, right? I mean, you you, you got a number of amount of time. The essential idea that you're trying to do is suppose you have a program where i equals uh, j plus k and a equals x plus y, right? If in your program you see something like this, right? And if you want to parallelize this, you can see that nothing from here depends on, on this line. So potentially you could do a thread create into a function and put this in, inside a function and make them run in parallel, right? That's the basic, super basic idea, right? And you probably don't want to do this for this little operation because the overhead to create the thread would, would kill you. So suppose this happens to be an, a matrix, right? These are all matrix, matrices, right? Then you expect it to be trivially, trivially parallelizable because you expect this to take some amount of time, especially for the, for the uh, homework, you have a 512 by 512 matrix. So you have lots of uh, operations to happen. So if you have a matrix operation, so especially if it's like a multiplication, then you have a O of n cubed algorithm, right? The algorithm we looked at was a order of n cubed, right? So it depends on, so the complexity for people who take a theory of computing is you know, 512 cubed, right? So it's a very expensive operation. So something like this would, would definitely make sense, right? So this is trivially parallelizable. Of course, the assignment is not like this. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to find instances where you can easily parallelize, right? So the way you solve that is to look at the, understand the problem and how it's, it's solving it, right? 
So it looks like you have a matrix. You have two matrices, right? You are going through rows and you're going through columns, right? You are, you are multiplying the corresponding this vector with, with that vector and then you are updating this element, right? And the next iteration, I, I think you're going with the same row and you're going with this column, right? And you're, you're updating this element, right? And the next iteration, you're doing same row, right? Is, is that, that's how it's going, right? And it's doing this, right? And then the next iteration would be you take the next row and you look at this column, right? So one easy way to, to parallelize this would be if you notice these things, these all don't depend on each other, right? This can happen with this and this can happen. Each of the columns can happen independently, right? But you can't proceed to the next level because if you go to the next row, you're going back to this column and it depends on the values from the previous one, right? And the way you achieve that is to using locking, right? To make sure that you don't go so fast that you're using the old values, right? So you get parallelism by making these things go in parallel, but the constraint is you can't let them go really wild because the next row needs this column. So you want the new value of the star and the old value of everything else, right? And you update this with, with that one. Does that make sense? So, so try to understand how the algorithm works. Try to write it out. Try to see what is being modified. And if you see something which is not, which looks significant, because you know, in this case you're you're multiplying this vector with this vector, so it's a phi 12 by phi 12. Uh, there's a whole bunch of multiplications, right? You could do this in parallel to this, and this parallel to this, and parallel to this, and stuff, right? Don't try to make this this project more complicated than it has to be, right? Don't don't try to make it super comp super um, nice or whatever, right? So one way, one simple way you could get away with this is you could make it extremely dynamic where each thread picks its task, right? You can make this program sort of simple, right? By saying one fourth here goes to one thread, one fourth here goes to one thread, one fourth here goes to one thread, and you wait for all of them to finish before you go to the next line, right? Which means that even if one thread goes much faster and finishes it, it, it it's, it's not going to be really optimal. It's not going to get the next job. But sort of having this, you make your program a little bit easier to debug, right? You kind of statically say, one thread will look at one fourth, another thread will look at one fourth, another thread will look at one fourth, another thread will look at one fourth. After each thread is done, it waits for the next cycle. Next cycle is the next row. <coughs> And then you start to do this, do this kind of thing, right? So that that's a simple way to get away with this. I mean, if you're writing professional code, you might say each column would be given to the next thread, right? So if a thread is going really fast, then it gets to it gets more <coughs> more columns and all those things. But don't worry about this because we're not we're not trying to find the the race is, here is not to find the best running program, right? Um, all I want to see is if you sort of have the, the time to run your program and the um, number of threads or CPUs you have, right? You have four CPU machines, right? You sort of expect the time to run the program to kind of keep going, keep going down, right? Not, not go to zero access, but essentially as you add more processors, you expect it to um, linearly kind of go down, right? You'll find that it's not going to go down linearly, it sort of goes down like this because of your, uh, of the inefficiencies, right? Which means that if it took four minutes to run with one processor, you're not gonna get one minute, you may get two minutes, right? But you definitely don't expect it to take six minutes, right? If one processor took four minutes, four processor cannot take six minutes, right? You'll, you'll be surprised how easy it is to actually make it go to six minutes. If you put locks in the wrong places, then it can actually go slower than what you expect, right? But for this homework, even if that happened, um, 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 it's okay, as long as you kind of have a reasoning of why that happened, right? Again, again, the, the goal here is not to see who's the fastest, who's the, the prettiest code. I'm not looking at the code, I just want you to see how, how it is done, right? 
that's what you do for any any uh, parallel algorithm. You're, you're trying to kind of split split it to to see where there's parallelism and, and trying to do that. Right? Does that make sense? <coughs> and essentially, you'll, you 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 use locks to prevent it to go from to the next cycle till something is finished. Right? And then along the way, there are other constraints which 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 probably delay your project, which is you realize that if you do exit on any thread, your whole program exits. Right? So you have to get get used to the fact that threads are all. I mean, each thread is co-equal. There is no main thread who is controlling, and there is other threads, right? If any other thread you do exit, whole program will will go, right? So you have to be careful to make sure that all the threads are, are continue continue to run, right? And one of the other other um, errors that you may see. And if you, if you see it, you should recognize this is from the homework, from the exam one. You, I think this question was asked, which is, if you, so you, you, ha, you can only pass one argument to the thread, thread create, right? So the traditional way to do that is to put it into a structure, right? You just put it in the structure and pass the argument, right? So you may have something like, <coughs> let's say, um, this is what, this is how you pass the stuff, right? So you're, you're passing x and y, so you put it inside a structure called x and y, and then you pass it into a thread create, right? So frequently, what you tend, you may tend to do is, you may tend to do, It's tempting to call something like this, right? To say something, you know, these these quadrants, this thread should work on, and these quadrants, this thread should work on, right? It seems logical, right? You, you kind of say, you know, so you split this program into four different quadrants. For the first thread, you're going giving these these two arguments. For the second thread, you give these two arguments, right? Do you know what what would what would go wrong in this case? And, and say let's here struct m is in the local context, right? It's thread specific data for the main thread, right? Would this work? It can't work because that's why I'm pointing it out. So yeah. Just gave the first set of pointer to the structure, so it's going to see the new values that you just put in there, three and four. Yeah. So what what you really had did was here you created a new thread, right? And let's say this is the m, right, the x and y, and you gave this address to this thread, right? And then you create another thread here, and you gave it the pointer to the same thing here, right? They're both they're both running concurrently with the main thread, and they're both sharing the same variable, right? So when you see this m, m dot x equals three, right? So it used to be this is one, this is two, and then you change this to three and change this to four, right? Since both of the threads are looking at the same stuff, right? So x seen by either of the threads can be either one or three. Y seen by either of the threads can be two or four, depending on how they get to run, right? You don't want to be in the case where the outcome depends on your pure luck. Does that make sense? You have one data structure called M, right? Thread create is not the same as your tr traditional uh, single threaded application. You created a thread, and that thread is running independently, right? And that, that means that when you finish here, the thread is not finished. It, it, may, it might have started, but you, start, you started the process of creating a thread, right? So. There is no expectation on where, where this thread is when you come here. So when you modify this value here, it's the same as you modifying the stuff here, right? So depending on how this other thread gets to run, it might see the old value or the new value, right? This is exactly what, you, what was asked in the homework the, in the exam one, right? This is thread-specific data on the, on the local context, right? It's not supposed to be shared, but you're sharing it because you're sending a pointer to it. Now it's, it's shared, and once it's shared, one one person modifying it will see the other way, other way, right? So you'll you'll have cases like these when you write the program. So um, you should have started the project. If you haven't 
start it now, right? So either think about how the algorithm works, how you might parallelize it you know, your own way, and then um, once you start coding, you'll, you'll run into these kind of issues, right? Keep in mind, I'm not looking to see how fast things are, and so don't try to make it more complicated. If you do want to make it more complicated, try to make a simple program work, get some graphs, and then you can spend more time on making it more complicated, right? The thing you'll learn is these things are so complicated that if you intentionally want to make it more complicated, it'll go out of hand, right? It, 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 it's, it's, you might get lost in all the details, right? The, the idea here is not to make you get lost in details. So keep it as simple as possible, get the first version running, and then you can try the other version, right? Does it make sense? At the least you can do is you start, get started, right? Both on the syntax and the how you're going to solve the problem. Um, this is not necessarily a thing that you can do a pull a one nighter, an all nighter, and then finish it, right? So I, I'll try to be online. So if you, if you have any questions, send me an email, uh, I'll chat, or what, what have you, especially late at night. So I haven't updated the website. Oh, the test will be on Monday, right? The consensus or pseudo consensus was it'll be on Monday. Um, so we'll cover the next module on Friday, but that won't be on the exam. So. So are there any questions, concerns about what we covered so far? I think synchronization is one of the more harder of the topics. I think the next two topics are, are fairly straightforward. Um, the next two modules are more like the first module than the second module, right? Um, the second module involves these, these constructs, especially these, since they are, they are concurrent, right? The theory behind all the stuff you're talking about is what you'll probably learn in a grad level operating system class. Um, and they're fairly complex because you're trying to look at the whole reason why we worry about all the stuff is it's it's very trivial to make them go uh, in a in a single process in a single thread, right? But if you have more threads, right, you don't want it to be completely unpredictable. So you want speed and you want some sort of predictability. So that, that's why you you get this notion of serializability and complex serializability and all, which don't precisely define what order your program will run. It gives you a little bit of flexibility in, in in running them in parallel. But it also gives you some guarantees, right? And as you write these programs, you'll realize that if you have no guarantees, then your pro output, you cannot guarantee what the output will be. So you, you can say the output of this program will be any of this range of values, which is not acceptable, right? So, but if you want it to go lockstep, you can guarantee the outputs, but you don't get much performance. So you're trying to find a balance, and, and that, that may not be a trivial task, right? And like I said, most of the, the, the future is towards these kind of processes, so we are kind of stuck with these, these, these stuff, right? This was always important, but it used to be important for you know, like supercomputers and all those things. And now you, you're seeing more and more of your own, own laptops uh, do this stuff, right? And, and the technology has improved. Like most of you don't notice deadlocks because of multiple processors on your laptops or desktops, like you would have if you had bought your machine in 2000, right? If you bought a machine in 2000, when the uh, machines are getting to be uh, multi-processor, multi right? Frequently, you'll find that the operating system is not is not multi-processor. It, it only knows about one processor. It only runs on one one processor kind of stuff. And when they started to go towards true multi-processor, you notice too many deadlocks and stuff, right? You still notice those, but not as much as what it used to be, right? And you'll see that the the application programs have to kind of go into this place because. If you don't go multi-threaded, your dual-core processor is practically useless. So no, nobody who writes code wants to say, you know, I, I can run at 1x speed with one, one core, but if you have four core, I still run at 1x speed. Right? You want it to be faster, right? So it's, it's important, and, and it's kind of um, 
not the easiest topic to realize, right? Especially since I, I went through what you learned in database in like one or two lectures, right? So it's, you know, it, it's, it's being unfair, but such is the, um, this topic, right? So we left off with look, looking at what is a deadlock, right? And deadlock precisely is when you, when you get into a place where nobody can make progress, right? And everybody's kind of stuck in this, this circular weight. And you have four different conditions which have to be true. All of them have to be true for you to get, uh, get into deadlock, right? You, you have to have resources which are not preemptible. You have to have resources that you're holding and you want more, right? You have to have circular list, circular weight, and you have to have a hold and weight. You have to hold some resources and can get weight for new resources, right? And I, I kind of alluded to the fact that nobody actually run, runs these things on real systems. Nobody actually worries about deadlock. But you have to understand why people don't worry about it, right? So before we get to that point, let's, let's look at ways of preventing deadlocks, right? So there are, we, we left off at how, how you may prevent deadlocks. And the way you prevent deadlocks is you make sure that one of those conditions can never happen. If one of the conditions can never happen, you cannot have deadlocks, right? And it may or may not be possible for what you're trying to do, right? So the first one is the notion of mutual exclusion, right? which means that a particular resource can only be used by one person at a time. And, and I think we left off by saying you could, you could kind of fudge that by putting a buffer between the resource and, and by the process asking. If it's a printer, you can say the, print, the printout is not actually going to the printer, but it's going to a print buffer, print spool, or what have you. So your process writes into this buffer, and some other process reads from the buffer and sends it to the printer, right? So traditionally, it's configured such that nothing goes to the printer till you, you finish your program. So if you, if you finish your program, then all of it goes to the printer, and other process gets to wait, right? So you kind of create a serial order. Essentially, you're creating a serial order on the resource. From an application perspective, it looks like you're writing to the printer, but the printer is no longer a, a, a mutually exc you know, exclusive resource. Anybody can share because you're basically writing to a different buffer that you sent to the printer uh, in a serial order, right? It may or may not be possible for everything, but it's possible for a printer, right? especially for a, a write-only medium, right? Um, but for other ones, it may, may not be possible. For example, if you're trying to do a tape drive or something, depending on what you're trying to do, it may not be possible because it has to read from the actual tape, and they're uh, all waiting for the tape, right? Uh, the, the next guarantee, the next reason why you get a deadlock is you hold some resources and you ask for more, right? You cannot get into deadlock if you don't have any resources because if you don't have any resources, you cannot get into circular uh, weight, right? So if you hold some resources and ask for more, you're potentially holding some resource that could be used, used by somebody else, right? So the way you avoid that is to say you can only ask once, or you can only ask a certain way such that you, you, um, you avoid the stuff, right? So you can say, before you start execution, you have to get all the resources you want such that either you, 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 you proceed or you, you wait, right? So I get all the resources so that once I start running, I would never have to ask for anything. Right? So I never get into the hold and wait. I only get hold, but I don't, I don't wait. I don't wait for any more resources. Right? And the other way is to, um, is to say you can only ask if you have no other resource. So I don't, I don't insist that you should start at the front, but when you want a resource, you should give away all your resource, and then you have to ask for everything and get some stuff. Right? What is the problem with, with these two approaches? Why would you prefer or why would you not prefer these approaches? If you want to implement this on a real system, right? Why would you not want this approach? Let's take the first one. Why would you not want to ask all the resources that you need before you start your program? Think of this as a programmer, right? If you're a programmer, yes? If you don't need them all at once, or you only need them for like a little bit, you don't need to request them all at once. Yeah, that, that's, that's an excellent point, right? Maybe you don't need all the resources all the time. So if you're running a long-running program, right, that means you need to ask for every resource that you ever want before you start, right? So suppose you have a program which needs to compute for four days, right, and then it wants to print something for the last, last day, right? With this approach, you need to hold on to the printer for the entire four days, right? Because you might, you might ask something at the end which might cause a deadlock, right? So in the worst case, you're, you're, 
extremely wasteful because you're holding on to resources that you don't really need and you, you, you're waiting for that, right? So you could kind of solve that with this notion of you kind of give up all your resources and wait for a new one, right? Is there another concern that how would you program this thing? How would you think of think of how you program the you know program your programs right? How you write your programs? How would you write a program where you request all the resources upfront? How do you write a program right now? So if you want to write a printout to a screen, right, or, or, or whatever, right? Do you think about all the things that you're going to do in your program upfront when you're writing a program, right? So this has to be in the first sentence, right? It has to kind of be known upfront, right? Do you think about all the stuff, or do you want the compiler to figure out all the stuff that you could be using, right? And it's not as trivial to say the let the compiler figure out, right? Because a lot of times it's, it's dynamic, right? You open a file based on what the argument is kind of stuff, right? You don't, you don't want to say, I want to use a printer. You may say, I want to use a printer. And when you're running, it may turn out to be a particular printer, right? Instantiate a particular printer, right? So with this approach, you have to kind of know everything that you're going to do for the whole program and say it up front. Many of us don't program like that. I mean, we kind of program where you kind of keep going, and then when you want to uh, printer, you just call a printer. Whatever happens to be assigned to you is what you use, right? So yes, it'll avoid deadlocks, but it makes your programs, uh, writing a program, a lot more tricky, right? Make sense? So the other, other, other notion is, you know, the notion of a preemption, right? One of the other conditions is um, the resources are non-preemptible. Which means that once you have a resource, unless you give it up, it can't be taken away from you. Right? You relax that to say you make the resources preemptible. Right? Again, it won't work for all cases. It might work for some cases. Right? It doesn't work for, say, printer, because if you preempt your printer, you, if it was actually printing directly to the printer from your program, you're may, maybe halfway through. Right? Preempting you would mean that the printer was like halfway in your program. Right? So if you preempt it, give it another one, they'll start printing from the stuff, right? And you don't want that, right? So if you don't want half your homework assignment to be printed, then give it to your other friend who writes the rest of the half. So you have bits and pieces on the printout, and you have to kind of cut and paste and, and join those stuff, right? But for other resources, it might work. So in those cases, you preempt it. Essentially, you take all the resources from you and put you on the wait list for all the resources. So before you proceed, so if, I, if I want another resource, I give up all my resources, right? And before I make progress, I wait for all the ones I had plus the ones I wanted. So once I get all the ones I had and the ones I wanted, I can make progress. Right? Again, it's being pessimistic because, it, it, as we'll see in a little bit, uh, little bit, it's not the case that if all these conditions are about to be, if some of these conditions are about to be met, you get into a uh, deadlock condition. Right? Just because you have resources that are non-preemptible does not mean that you will get into a deadlock. All four has to happen. But if you look attacking only one component, that means for applications which, so suppose your only application which is not sharing anything else, right? Suppose you're using a resource that nobody else wants. So in that case, it, it does not matter whether it's preemptible or non-preemptible, because no one else wants the resource. That means nobody else is going to do the hold and wait on that particular resource. So you may be safe, right? But we can't think that deeply. So all you can do is look at each condition you're knocking them off. Uh, and as you'll see, in the, in the real system, these tend to be um, overly wasteful. So you may not, you may not want that. right? Because you're, you're going to be saying, this particular resource, nobody else cares. So why, why would I want it to be preemptible? Because I know there's no way it can be in a deadlock condition. right? And, and the, the last one is a circular weight. Right? Circular weight is, is when you notice a, a, a deadlock has happened, where you have a resource that you're holding and you're waiting for another resource. And the way to avoid that is to define some sort of ordering, right? Give each resource some sort of a number. If you want to prevent a circular weight, right? The way you do that is to have, you give some uh, arbitrary numbers to each other resource, uh, increasing order. And you say you can only request a new resource on a higher number than what you had, right? So that way you're, you're only allowed to, so if you had resource number one, it doesn't matter what that is, right? You're only allowed to ask for like something higher. So from one, you can go to four. 
But from four, you cannot ask for three. If you want to ask for three, you have to give up all everything and then start uh, fresh, right? So this way, you're kind of forcing that I have to ask in a certain way, but I can never get into a circle of weight because I'm, I'm going to go you know, linearly up, but never go back, right? So again, this will solve your problem, but it might, might, might or may not make sense for your particular application because it kind of messes up your logic, right? It all depends on you defining what the resources you want as a programmer and being able to sell it to a system and being able to insist on some kind of order and, and proceeding with that, right? But if you want to uh, prevent deadlocks, this is what you have to do. You have to make sure that one of these conditions don't ever happen, right? One, one or more conditions, right? And the, the other way is, so those are the ways you, you implement that in a static fashion. The other algorithm is, is to avoid deadlocks when the system is running, right? So in this case, the, so rather than doing a static analysis, you want to let the program run, but before I give you any resource, I, I want to make sure that you cannot get into a deadlock. I still want to avoid the four conditions, but I let you run, but I want to make sure that you never get into a place where you may cause a deadlock. So every time you proceed, right, if you're asking for a resource, I have to make sure that if I give you this resource, will, I, will, you, will anybody else get into a deadlock, right? This is a little bit more relaxed. I let you run, but every time you ask for a resource, I have to check not only your program, but every program in the system to make sure that me giving you a resource will not cause uh, a deadlock for anybody else, right? So this way you will avoid deadlock. So you, you, kind of, you kind of let you run, but the moment that it looks like you may cause a deadlock, you, you wait. I, I basically put you to wait, right? So you'll never get into a deadlock, right? Um, so some of the uh, mechanisms, you know, the simpler one is to uh, always declare what you want. Um, and and you, you, will, you will need to do some of those stuff. You need to say what you want for these systems to work, right? Um, and, and, and we'll see what one, one of the algorithms which, which um, um, implement that called the Bankers algorithm. And you, are, you have to run some sort of algorithm to dynamically check. So if you ask for a resource, I, I, I virtually give you the resource. Run algorithm to see if you get into a circular weight. If by me giving you a resource, there's a circular weight possibility, then I get the resource back, right? So it's, it's more heavyweight. So I need, you need to tell me what you would want. I need to see every time I allocate something, if there's a circular weight, if there's a weight, then I, I get, take the resource back from you. Um, I need to know how many, how many resources there are, how many, so the system has to know a whole, whole lot more. It has to know how much you want, how much you have right now, how much the system has, how much it has given out, and stuff like that, right? So, do not understand how these things work. You define a notion of a safe state, right? You define a safe state is if you're in a, in a program, if, you're, if your system, if pro operating system is in a state where a certain, if you run operating system, the uh, process in a certain fashion, each of them will finish their task and then give up their pro what they have to make this happen, right? And that's called a safe state. To give you an example, one of the analogies we'll see how we, we implement this is through the use of bankers algorithm, right? It's supposed to be how the bankers used to operate. I'm not sure if they operated uh, uh, this, this way right now or not, right? So when you go to a bank, the banks give you loans, right? Our, our credit, um, so our, our um, credit limits, right? That, that's exactly how they give you a loan. So every one of you, let's say you have a credit card and you have a credit, um, you, you have a credit limit, right? So let's say each one of you got a credit limit of 5,000, right? So that means, uh, like, let's say 1,000, right? So you have five people here. So that means all of you can um, have up to $5,000. I mean, all of you want $5,000 from the bank, right? The banks need not necessarily have $5,000 in the in, in the wall, right? It, it does not have to have $5,000 in the vault to give you all a credit limit of 5,000, right? Because that's wasteful, right? So what they have to do is they have to make sure that if you come in a certain way, I can give you the money that you wanted, right? But I'm also allowed to make you wait. In, in real banks, you can't do that. But in the fictitious bank, I can make some people wait. I can solve, I can give money to all of them. If I can make all of them happy, I'm okay, right? I'm only getting into trouble if if I promised money to two of them and both of them want at the same time and I couldn't give them, uh, and, uh, leave in a state where, where it has to fail, right? So it's okay for the bank to say, 
if the bank only had $1,000, right, it might solve all this problem by saying, basically, I can give to one person, and then the assumption is you have to repay the bank. Right? You have to give up the resource. So I can give the money to first person, then the second person, then the third person, then the fourth person, then the fifth person. So all of them will be happy. All of them get their credit limit, whatever they were, they were promised. The banks do not have to guarantee that it has to be in a certain uh, time. Right? So you may have to wait for a little bit. The banks expect you to pay. So if, if nobody pays, the banks will go under. Right? I think the current model of banking is not exactly this, because the banks seem to go under. But you, you expect that this is what happens, right? So the banks, so you don't want to go into a case where every time I give somebody a credit limit, I have to have that money in the bank, because that's wasteful, right? So even though I give a, a credit limit of 1,000 to each of, uh, each of them, if, if they don't all use that limit, right, there's no point in me having $5,000 in the bank waiting for them to come back and get the money, right? So that, that's, that's sort of the analogy of how you work with this. And that's essentially what you're trying to do here, right? So I'm trying to see with the amount that I have left over, is it possible for somebody to make progress and do this stuff, right? The way you define progress is, suppose I have $200 left, right? So if I can find somebody in here who, even though they all had $1,000 as a credit limit, right? If I can give the $200 to that person, eventually they'll have to finish it because all of them have to finish. So once they finish, right? They were promised up to a thousand, right? So if they if they had already gotten, let's say, uh, eight hundred dollars, I give them two hundred dollars. So now they have thousand dollars, right? So when they finish, they release the thousand dollars back to me, right? And I can use that thousand dollars to give to the rest of the people, right? So if I can find a sequence where all of everybody will get what they want, so everybody has to say how much they want, how much they currently have how much they need, you know, which is basically how much they want minus how much they have. If I can find a sequence such that all of you can be satisfied, then it's a safe state, right? The bank does not have to worry. But if it reaches a point where it's not possible to, to, uh, to um, service everybody, it comes to a point where the only way to service somebody is to say, even though I promised you a credit limit of $1,000, even though you said you wanted $1,000, and even though you only have $200, I can't really give you more than $600. No, that's not acceptable, right? As long as you find some sequence, that's a safe state. That's essentially what you're trying to say, right? If you find a sequence which, which is possible, where each process, you give it all the resources. When it's done, you expect all the resources to come back to you, and you use that to give to other, other people. If you can't find such a state, that means you are you are unsafe state. Unsafe state does not mean that you're in deadlock. Unsafe state does not mean, so you're in deadlock here because if, you, if I expect, if, you know, that person wants more money and I don't have more money, right? So we are, we are kind of stuck in that case. So unsafe state, state does not mean that you will get in deadlock, right? That's because even though I had promised someone $800 more, because they wanted $1,000 and I only give them $200, they may never actually use it, right? So even though it, if they potentially come and ask, I don't have any money to give them, they may never ask for it, right? In which case, I don't have to get into deadlock, right? So the safe state says that if you're in a safe state, the system can, in the worst case, not get into deadlock. But the, the opposite of safe state is unsafe state. Unsafe state means that you could potentially get into deadlock if everybody cashes in their chips. But if they don't, you don't have to get into a deadlock, right? So safe state is good. Unsafe state, we can't really tell what is happening. Unsafe state, we can say whether you are in a state where potentially something can go wrong, but it may actually not go wrong if, if things don't uh, turn out a certain way, right? So the, the goal of the deadlock avoidance is to make sure that you never get into the unsafe state, not, not go from unsafe to the deadlock state, right? That's living on the edge. You, you basically say, I, I won't let you go into a deadlock state. So I keep, I, every time somebody asks something, I run the algorithm to see if you'll get into a deadlock. If you will, I, I, I back out, right? So essentially that's the thing. So if you're in a, if you're in a safe state, there can be no deadlock. If you're in a safe state, I know a certain sequence of operations that can happen such that I can get out, right? And it does not say anything about how long it will take. It does not say anything about how efficient things will be, right? So it may mean that to get out of the safe, in the safe state, I may have to give money to each one of them. Each one of them has to finish and give me back the resources and then make progress, which means the last one in the queue may have to wait for a long time. 
none of these things concern about how much time you do. All they are trying to see is, is there a possible way to get out, right? And that's the differentiation between deadlocks and starvation. The, the notion that if I don't service you at all for a year, you will starve, but I know that eventually I can service you, right? Whereas in deadlock, even given infinite time, I cannot service you. So you, we, are, we are not concerned about starvation, we are concerned about deadlock, where we want something to happen, right? So if it is safe, it's safe. If it is unsafe, that means potentially something can go wrong in the worst case. So you, you want to make sure that we'll never get into a deadlock state. And actually, the, they have a figure here. So safe state is good. You would potentially like to go into the unsafe state, because unsafe state is not all deadlock state. But you don't know where you are, right? So you, you kind of you kind of let it, you, you try not to go into the unsafe state, right? So the, the one of the ways you can, you, know, you can uh, figure out whether you're going to be in deadlock state is to use a resource allocation graph, which is what we did before, right? Where here, when you start your process, you tell all the resources that you want, and those are marked by dotted arrows, right? When you actually want a resource, you change the data to a real arrows. So you, you run the algorithms to see if you ever get into a circular weight, even on the dotted arrows, right? So th this is the, so if you, let's say process P1 wants R2, process P2 wants R2, process P1 wants R1, process P2 wants R1. So the two processes, they both want, both want resource R1 and R2, right? And you represent that like this, right? So right now it means that process R1 is assigned to P1, right? Right now P2 wants R1, which is what we, we, we looked at before when we talked about resource allocation graph. This dotted arrow means that potentially at some point in the program, P1 can request R2. Potentially at some point in the program, P2 can request R2. They haven't asked right now, right? So at this stage, it's only those has been allocated, R2 is free, right? So at this state, you can't really say whether they are uh, in deadlock or whatever, right? But if, if, R, if, if P2 requests R2, right, you could give it because R2 is, uh, was free, you can give it, right? But then you run the algorithm, right? So you run the algorithm looking for circles, including the dot arrow. So now you see that there's a, it completes a circle, right? So if I give R2 to P2, potentially you get into a deadlock, right? Even though there's no such deadlock right now, right? Even though it means that P1 may want R2 at some point, but it may be the case that P2 wants R2 for a second and gives it back and you're in a safe state, right? But according to the theory, like at this point, you could potentially get into a deadlock because if P1 makes a request for R2, you will you will be in a deadlock, right? So this safe is unstate, unstable, and that's 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 one of the ways you use resource allocation graph. You extend it to include all the resources that you currently have and that you will ask for, and for the ones that you are asking for, you put a dotted dotted lines. You're trying to see if there's any circle is possible. So before I do a resource allocation, if you ask for a resource, I run the algorithm to see if there's a circle uh, circular weight. Uh, if there are, I, I deny the service, right? So going back to the, the banker's algorithm, which is, which is de developed by Ed, Ed Dijkstra, which was one of the first um, operating system researchers, right? He passed away a few years back. Um, I think he was working on this like in 60s or so, right? So this is, this is the algorithm of the, uh, the one I was uh, just explaining. You have multiple resources. You can think of this as currency, right? So each one of you has a credit limit of a certain number of dollars. You don't really care what dollar it is, you just want the resource. You want the resource which has multiple instances. And the idea here is I, I promise each one of you a resource. And I don't have enough resource to solve everyone independently, right? Because that's a baseful thing. So all I want to do is I have to have enough resources such that I can service everybody, right? The banks never want to be in a case where you ask for a resource, I don't have it we get into a, a bad situation. So I have to keep checking that if I want to give you money that you asked for, if there's a possible way for me to get out, right? The way to get out is somebody has to finish and then return the resources back to me, right? And if that is not possible, then I don't give the resource, right? And, and that's, that's the algorithm um, that you want. So for this to run, you have to have a notion of how much resources we have, how much money we have in total, 
how much money you will ever ask in a program, how much you have asked so far, and how, mu how much has been allocated to, to you so far, and how much you will ask in the future, right? So that's, that's so the, I'm, I'm going to list the algorithm a little bit. I mean, you, you probably have to run it through um, in, your, in your dormitory later on, right? So essentially, they, they have the four, four different data structures. One is available, right? It, it tells you the amount of resources that are currently available, right, the, uh, in the system. And max tells you how much resources there are in, in total, right? So when you start the system, you have max amount of resources. And available tells you how much is left right now, right? And for each process, allocation tells you how much has been allocated to you, and need tells you how much you would need, right? How much you need to finish the task. So when you start the program, you tell me how much resources you need, and I keep track of how much you need, how much you've been allocated, how much is in the entire system, and how much of the entire system stuff has been allocated, right? So use these four arrays to figure out if I can make a safe uh, assignment to you, right? So if you, if you go through the algorithm, essentially it, it tries to see if I, give the, if I give the resources to you, right? I virtually give the resource to you, and then in this loop, right, I set everything to be not finished. I set all the process to be not finished, right? And then I see if the resources I have left over after I give the resource to you, which is the um, the work, right? I see if all of you who need resources can be given from what I have, right? So I look for a process in the system which can be satisfied with what I have. So if I have something like $600 left over, and I look, look to see how much of each of you would want, right? If it turns out all the process who are left may need $800, that means we're in a bad state because I can, I can never potentially give money to anybody, right? It's, it's a worst case scenario, right? Does that make sense? So I have $600 left. Each of the processes say they might need $800 more to complete, right? So what we're trying to see is if the $600 can potentially help somebody, right? And it cannot, and that's a bad situation, right? There is a condition what, what might happen is somebody who's already running may not actually want what was promised, may just finish, may release what they have, and I may be in a safe state, but that's not how we go, right? We try to see, I have $600, everybody needs $800, I cannot proceed. But if I have $600 and somebody wants $400, then I basically give that person virtually the, the $400 from my cash, let them finish, and then I take whatever money that I gave plus what they had, right? That's, that's how much they would release. I take that back, and then I run the algorithm again to see now I have, let's say, $1,000. See how many processes I can, I can finish, right? So potentially, if I give the $1,000 to, to that person, and they, they will finish, and when they finish, they'll give me back the thing. So I keep going through this loop, trying to see if I can do this. If at the end, all of you would have finished. When I set all the finish of array to be I, I to be true, that means I found a sequence such that allocation could have been done to all of them and they would have finished, in which case I can, uh, there's, there's no deadlock. If I cannot find such a sequence, then this allocation uh, is unsafe. Did that make sense? I, I suggest you, you go through the, you know, the, the the annotation that the, the, the book talks about. But essentially the idea here is I want to see if there's any possible way they can, they can go, right? And I'm not trying to see, I'm trying to be optimistic. I'm trying to make sure that there is, in the worst case, I can make progress, right? So I'm not trying to see that maybe this one person will never ask for a resource, that's not my concern. I want to see if there's a possible way. So if I can finish, so I virtually give this resource and if I can't find a sequence, I, I back out, right? So the, the, the entire algorithm is basically, I, 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 you ask for a resource, I virtually give it to you, and I run this algorithm. And if I run the algorithm, if it says it's a safe state, then I make the allocation. If it comes back as it's not safe, then I, 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 deny the, I, I make you wait. Right? I make you wait for somebody else to finish this resource, then I can give the stuff to you. Right? So I'm going to leave it at that, but um, 
I don't think I'm going to go through the example in class, right? The, the, with the numbers and stuff. I'll see if I can. Um, but it's, e it's easier if you go through it offline um, rather than in class, right? So if you have any, any questions, we can, we can follow, follow along on the next lecture, right? See you on, on Tuesday, Wednesday.